But the first question I thought we really have to ask ourselves is, why are you here today? Why do you think that Holocaust denial is something that we should talk about on this campus? Or as a society in general? Why is this issue? People don't understand it. Tell me what the it is. What do they not understand? They don't understand why it happened. Okay, right. You might be here because you want to know why in the world would anybody actually do this? And deny something that's the Holocaust. What else? Why did you come today? And the answer that you have to be here for a class or paper does not count. <laughs> Why are you here? Well, it's just a topic that fascinates me anyway. You have people denying we landed on the moon. You have people denying that this occurred. And when you have, obviously, so much physical evidence and evidence from the media, you know, the newspapers, you have, you have all kinds of documentation that it happened. It's, it's really hard to understand how anybody can convince himself that it is not. It's like, why things so mind boggling? I mean, as much as we have one piece of evidence, but we have eyewitness testimony. We have survivors. We, we have, have pictures. <laughs> we have documents. Right? I mean, there's literally millions of documents that make it obvious. We have cameras. This happened. Exactly. Right? We have cameras. Yes. <laughs> right? The physical evidence. Yeah. Even if those offenses destroy the end of the war, right, it is right there. So then why in the world are people doing it? <coughs> and how are they doing it, right? Because keep in mind, there's a reason why we talk about this. And this is actually what we do know. The college campuses are one thing, or one location. The Holocaust deniers target very specifically. There was a strong campaign, late 90s and the beginning of the century as well, to get ads placed in college newspapers that specifically were denying the Holocaust. And so that connection here, right, why are you doing it? But also, why do you focus on college campuses? I think that's funny. We most likely want to talk about it as well. Yeah. What else? Why are you here? Why are you interested in this topic? My quiet side over here. Now I'm in teacher mode. <laughs> well, I think the answer is everybody is here for a speaker paper, like you said. But it's also a time to get educated about a certain subject, such as this. Okay. All right. So basically, even if you're here because you have to get that paper done, you know what? You have a choice. And this is a societal issue from the, sound, from the looks of it. But don't tell me why it is. Why is this something you say societal? That society is on the whole? Because we have facts covering this, like they said. We have, we have camps with documentation on it. And I think it's a real issue, or the real question is, why would people deny facts? Mm -hmm. Good. So it's not just that the fact of the Holocaust denied, that are entirely of knowing, right? It's a threat. If ultimately people are able to undermine what we consider as secure knowledge, mm -hmm. our, our epistemology, that's its thing. Huh? Maybe one last person. Are they neo-Nazis <coughs> doing this? Oh, yes. <laughs> there are plenty of them there. When we talk about who are those folks, actually, you will see that Nazis most certainly are many of them, but in a scary manner, actually are. There are actually plenty of people in the Holocaust who probably, and I mean, of course, you can ask it. They wouldn't give you the an honest answer. <laughs> but probably actually are not Nazis. And then some of makes it scary as well. So if we want to talk about now what Holocaust denial actually is, but the first thing is we have to say, what actually is the Holocaust? Put this in your own words. What would you say is actually the Holocaust? How would you explain this? Evil. Good. Yes. Absolutely. It is probably in many ways the most horrific crime that has ever happened in human recorded history. Genocide and humanity. It is genocide. Let's do this very more systematically. Who is responsible? I. Who did it? Germany. Hitler. Yeah. Germany. Who knows? Right. Okay, so we have basically Nazis here. How many people did they kill? Yeah. Six million. At least six million. Right. Six million if you focus on the Jews. If we add everybody else in, it's up to twelve. So basically Nazis killed. Was it an accident? No. no. Right? It's policy. They killed intentionally. By policy. Six million? Jews and how? Gas chambers. Right? By gas chambers. Starvation. What? Slavery. Right? Starvation. Camps. And, and, and. Right? That will actually will be the most basic definition of the Holocaust that we can come up with. Now turn this around. So, what part of this do you think the Holocaust deniers reject and deny? I didn't believe we actually did it. 
that mm -hmm. any one person mm -hmm. was responsible for it. Yes. Think about this. Look at the components here. Let me tell you the deny every single one of them. Start with the first one. How can you deny the Nazis did it? Because the Nazis will say the government did it. Yes. Do you know what people say very famously? Hitler did not know. So in this case here, right? They hold Hitler as innocent. They say Hitler did not know. Have they read history at all? <laughs> well, see, that's the tricky thing. When we talk about the idea of why is this kind of people, you would be surprised that many of those guys know history very well and begin basically an intentional format to falsify it. But I think overall, for most people who are doing sophisticated matter, they actually do know the history. And they also know how to make it seem as if it has something different. Is this an issue that you're interested in? Because I can do this first to explain how this works. Yeah. Okay. So when you say Hitler does not know about the Holocaust, the way the Nazis make this case is by saying, show me the written order from Hitler that the Jews are to be killed. He can. Indeed you can. And why is that? Because Hitler didn't write the order. Is I there any he... written order that this is supposed to take place? Yes, he did. I know written order. Hitler told Eichmann to write it, and Eichmann sent it down to Hitler, which he sent it down to the Eichmann. He didn't solution. But is there a written order in any way that states that we will kill all the Jews? Isn't there something about how much stuff was destroyed in the bunkers before, toward the end of the war? But think about this. I promise no, you, even without any discussion. Wasn't it a verbal order, not a written order? But see, that's the idea. Was the thing is, you need to know basically how Hitler works. You know the famous thing, right? Hitler always had the light on in his chamber. Uh -huh. And basically, he was supposed to think, right, this man works until 2 or 3 o'clock every single morning. He's the hardest work ever. Nothing is further from the truth. You know how Hitler operates? Hitler usually had people come in from different ministries, let's say one from propaganda, one from defense or war, and they would give presentations to him. Then he would listen to this for five minutes and say, your case is better than go with this. So the fact that we have no written order is absolutely not surprising to anybody. Who is a historian? Because Hitler is a lazy person. This is not a man who sits there and reads files for two hours and then says, okay, here is my policy. But he will simply say, you are right, and you don't implement it. And that's it. And of course, Holocaust has no this. Right? That's why I was saying they know the history. They know how it operates. And when they claim we have no written order for this, they of course do know this order does not exist. But if you know the history, you know from the get-go why it wouldn't exist. Hitler does not work that way. Do you think that um, the deniers believe that it did not occur, or they want other people to believe it did not occur to, to whitewash the I think most of them probably do know very, very well what happened, and they also do know the extent very well, but for various reasons we will get to in a second here, right? Either because they're Nazis, maybe because they believe that fascism is an alternative preferable to democracy. They are trying to bring those back, and of course they understand what's the biggest obstacle to this, the accusation of genocide. So there are a number of motives here, but the answer is yes, I would say they do know what they're doing. But so in this case here, right, one thing you can do the Holocaust simply by saying is that the leadership did not know. That's the first thing. Killed intentionally. How can you deny this part? We didn't think the dozen was big enough to kill them in the gas chambers. Is that what they were Oh, we That's, oh, we got there. <laughs> we got there. Killed intentionally. Right, isn't it? Can say it was an accident? Correct. One very famous case is for the denies to say, okay, there are camps. And yes, there was starvation. But you know why this took place? It took place because of war. The Allies have surrounded Germany, food is scarce, therefore people are dying. You feed your population, you feed your soldiers, right? And who goes first? It's the people in the camp, right? And therefore they would say basically, oh, there is no intention here. Basically, in this case, you can make an argument, why right? it's almost like an accident. It's an exigencies of war. That's what leads to death. And that's why you kill, kill attention. By policy. How would you deny that? There's no written policy and do you even want to? No. Look. What they're basically saying is this is all a confusion about the language. If you ever read Holocaust now, the language game is really big. Really what they will say is, look, obviously Germany said in Germany says Auswahl. But what does this really mean? Does it mean annihilate, exterminate? Oh no, 
What this really stands for is deportation. You simply misread the evidence. So what they're basically doing is, they play semantics here. So what they're simply saying is, yes, of course, we have speech, speech is greater than Yes. I will exterminate. But what they're simply saying is, that is a misunderstanding. What he meant is, do deport. And so they deny that actually it is the Nazi policy to kill people. Keep going. Six million. But how do they justify keeping them in a camp to begin with? Well, what they're saying is, of course, the Jews were a danger to Germany. They were indeed dangerous. That's the classical case. They denied it, made. it's not true. That's what they would argue. Six million. How do you deny that? Say it's not an accurate number. No. Correct. Let me show you how that is being done. This here basically is an actually that been cast as wrong. I brought you four books here, all on Holocaust denial. I can press two around this way and two around this way. And from one of them, I took this chart. And take a look at this. Here, these are the most important studies of how Germans have determined how many Jews were actually being killed. And here, this is the earliest one, this latest one. You see this in slight variation numbers. When Holocaust analysts look at this, they say, well, obviously, the numbers must be much lower than six. And I think by now you have got the taste of how this would work. What argument do you think they make about this? What's the discrepancy here? About 2 million, isn't it? Okay. So if you might be off by 1.7 million one way, would it be possible? Oh, yes, you see where this is headed, right? That maybe you might be off 1.7 million also in this way. Now keep going. A Holocaust and I will tell you we have four studies here. And they do not agree. So is this good evidence for a number or is this bad evidence? Right? This is exactly the Holocaust I was Think about this. What are you doing? When you calculate the people who have died, you do a study of demographics. You study how many people are living in Europe before the Holocaust, how many people are there afterwards, and then you measure immigration to the United States, they go to Israel, talk about the refugee legislation, and we're moving people around. Right? And if you do this basically adding up, what you have is four people here say it's either 4.5, 5, 5.8, or 6.2. Four studies by different people, using different methodology, coming roughly to the same conclusion. Good evidence or bad evidence? Good. Think about this. If these four guys here, using different means, would come up with a number that's almost identical, that would confuse me. Think about how many countries you have to study, how many archives you have to go to. I would think that basically four studies that come up pretty much with the same number. I would be suspicious. Indeed, the fact there is some variation here that actually confirms to me that they have done these studies independently and overall roughly come to the same conclusion. So I would argue actually this is a good number. When we say about around 6 million, you can point to four studies that come to roughly the same conclusion. And that's good evidence. Now, if you are a denier, what will you argue about this? If you have four different outcomes, then obviously you do not know what you're doing, and therefore just throw them out the window, because if you say it's 4.5 or 6, it might be well be 3 or 1. So what they're basically saying is what is actually a strength in terms of the empiric evidence. They're saying it's a weakness. And they say if you have variation here, then you do not know what you're doing, and therefore the numbers are all fake. And that's the classic case for the cost of So what they're saying is the numbers here vary. The lowest one I've ever seen was about 300,000. And then sometimes, like, you know, they give you up to 2 million. But yes, using numbers game, they basically make the argument that 6 million is not a number to be taken serious. And this part over here, right? By gas chambers and caps. I think you have brought this up before. So how do you think you can deny the gas chambers? How do you kill that many people in <coughs> four years or five years? Yes. How do you kill so many people? But they're even better than this. Has any one of you ever heard about the infamous Luther Report? Oh, sorry. There was one guy who actually snuck into Auschwitz. And you probably remember that Auschwitz being blown up. And the Germans withdraw, they blow it up before the Russians come in there. And he actually went to the ruins of the crematorium. He picked up the stones from the gas chamber and scraped off the residue. And then went to a lab and had it measured. You know what he found? And note the guy's Holocaust in 
He said the residue was so low in the killing chambers, it was lower than the lousing chambers, that therefore gas chambers had clearly not been used to kill people. That's what he said. Such business going on. Now let's think about what the problem is. The first thing is, imagine you blow up a building in 1944, and you go in the 1990s, pick up a stone and say, let me measure the residue. What is happening? It's raining. <laughs> Correct. It has been exposed to the air for about 50 years. That's the first thing. That will impact your findings. Keep going. You would think, right, if you want to measure this, you would go to the outside of the stone, right, that was basically inside of the chamber. And then you strike there. You know what the man actually did? He basically hacked the stone into pieces and then measured the residue on the inside of the wall. Not the top layer, but the inside layer. And what does that do? Well, let's the All right, right. So now the number gets even lower. So that means that attempt already told you why this is fraudulent. Now keep going. Now what he's saying is, look, here's the residue in the claim chamber, here's the residue from the dousing chamber, and the one in the killing chamber is lower. Therefore, they were never used to kill, because otherwise, why? Right, the residue would be higher. Sounds reasonable to you? Why not? Because you waited too long. Yes, you waited too long. Chemicals are just simple. And Absolutely. It's, it's, you've gone too deep. But even worse than this. What else would you do with such equipment? Even worse than it. Think about this. What do you need more gas to kill with? A louse or a human being? A human being? Yes. Lice have actually a higher resistance to chemicals than we do. Indeed. So basically, the fact that actually dosage is lower in the chamber used to be in beings is perfect evidence that they are being killed there because you know what? It would not have been enough cyanide to actually kill off the insect. So involuntarily, this guy actually confirmed that they were used to human beings because otherwise the concentration would not have been high enough. And so if you take a look at this, the arrival of the simple argument is here. You know what? Not for killing. And that's why we have used this. Nice. So you look at this, then what do you have here? Denial. Correct. Okay. Right. Holocaust denials have been prolific in denying every single criteria within the definition of what the Holocaust actually is. And if you take a look here, right, about time that you go so far as to sneak into a camp and scrape off the residue, I think it tells you very nicely right, how sophisticated this actually has become. Have you stopped this here for the first time? And see if you guys have any question of what you have done so far. Any questions? Okay. Then next one. Let's talk about this. How do you do it? Think about this. If you go online, maybe you Google the Holocaust, and then at some point you find a report that says not enough cyanide, not enough chemical residue to kill Jews. Would you click on this? No. Would you click on this? No, because it would frustrate me. I'd have to shut it off. Okay, let me rephrase. Do you think many people might be likely to click on this? And look at the link. Alright, it sounds very much going against what you would think is true. Now, when you click on this web page, what do you think it looks like? You think it's going to be like a big swastika on top and says, like, you know, the fourth right will come? It's going to look like an educational website. Correct. Now, think about this. How do you make something look scientific, educational? What would you do? I'm trying to get studies to back to um, prove your denying. Correct, Crazy. right? Probably the first thing is when you have your denial law. Right? Let's do it if you do this report here. Probably. What would you say about the author? Ever been to one of the talks we have in the beginning? Remember, we always give you a bio? He'd be trying to self-justify himself. Correct. Probably would say, this person has a BA or an MA from this university. Of course, that probably wouldn't be in chemistry, right? But you're not going to say this part. <coughs> so you make it look scientific, just <coughs> saying that, you know, the author is somebody who's an advanced degree from a prestigious university. He's probably a lawyer. It doesn't matter. Then what else do you do to make it look good? You have links, you have, you have a bibliography, 
other sources cited, so it looks like you did your research. Correct. Right. And then, of course, when you click on those things, you know where you will end up? On other of their pages. But the idea is why to make it look scientific. And I think that's the first reason why this is surprisingly effective. I mean, from my own experience, I've had it at least four or five times in my life. There you have a paper, and about page three, something happens sort of like, of course, there are always two sides to any story. This is usually where I put my glasses down, this is something I'm not going to repeat since we have a camera on here. <laughs> but it wouldn't be very polite. But that's exactly when I know, oh yes, you went to deny that picture. Because it's right there. So make it look scientific is one way I'm doing. What else can you do to make this appear credible? Have some. Prestigious psychologists attest that the author was not sort of happening. Good, although I think probably you would hide that, right? But the idea is credibility. <laughs> think about this. Do you know what the most famous, in this case, institution in the United States is called that publishes Holocaust denial? Something like Truth About the Holocaust. Like oh, see, that will be given in the way, but you're in the right direction. It's called the Journal for Historical Review. Right? Sounds good. Think about this. What are historians doing? <coughs> what is our task? Our job? To review history. Exactly. Right? We sit down, we look at the events and say, this confirms this argument made by this historian or not. What do you do with dissertation? I sit down, I read every single people that have written on my subject before and said, you know what? I have a better interpretation than you guys all have together. And that's what you do. Right? You review the evidence and come to your interpretation. Now, when you read the journal for historical review, sounds good to you? It was like a very, very prestigious institution, right? They have their conferences, they have their speakers. If you look at the web page, you're not going to catch it. And that's why we make it credible. Who's, who's behind them? That's a very, very good question. The office got firebombed. So the way it basically works is that we have the names, but who the financiers for this are is not necessarily known. But it's basically a couple of very, very right wing people, most of fascist beings, and perfectly also considered. And that's what they all have in common. What else? Think about this. If I tell you today there are two sides to every story, how many of you raise your hands and say this is true? Okay, right? Think about this. Sounds credible? Mm -hmm. Have you kind of been, don't get me now, have you as Americans been raised in the belief that there are always two sides to every story? Mm -hmm. Yes, don't get mad at me. Right? But this is something that seems common sense to you. Somebody tells you, you know what? Of course, there are always two sides to every story. You are inclined to believe this. Because given the moral relativism that we have right now, that is something. I know, I know. But what I'm saying is, let me tell you, there are not two sides to every story. You have called me a positivist, but the answer is no. Why? The most good. Well, take the example here. What would be the other side to the Holocaust? The Nazis point of view of the Holocaust. Yes. And do you think this is their side of the story? The story. Their side of the story. Right, but see, they said that basically the Jews constituted a legitimate threat to the existence of their country and their people, and they had to kill them. Okay. Is that the other side of the story? It's yeah. the other side of the story, but does it make it right? No. Yeah. But it's still another side but of the story. But guess you If you have a bank robber and you ask him, right, why do you rob the bank and you say, I wasn't dead? Does that justify what happened? No. No. And that's the point, right? So there is no other side of the story. There's a reasoning behind this. But it doesn't mean there's a second story between two of you about this equivalent, as legitimate, as informative, as credible, right? As that sort of story. And I think because people are trained to always say, like, look, there are more perspectives than anything. I think that's one thing that people oftentimes fall into the trap. Okay. There's also an argument being made that people say, you know what, we want to depoliticize the Holocaust. Silo, could you say that there are two sides to every story, but one side is often nonsense? I would not. No. <laughs> See, the idea is, I mean, this is a, you have to look a little bit, but you can do this first. Think about this in this way. Imagine if we have a TV show on Holocaust denial. Should you invite a Holocaust denial to sit on the panel? Think about this, you have one guy here, I know, let's say like, you know, you have the chair in Holocaust studies at Brown University. Okay. And then, should you invite a Holocaust denier on the same panel? Yeah. You would say no, why not? 
because if you're trying to be informational about or informative about something, then you would try to keep it objective. Okay. And someone who has a very, very, very strong bias such as that would not be able to objectively look at the situation and judge it. Okay. Right, think about this. Uh, but your argument suggests that you couldn't have any ho Holocaust victims there or any Holocaust historians because they're very biased also, right? Depending on what your understanding is of the bias part, right? Yeah, right. So what I'm trying to say is if you talk about your right panel, you usually have experts on the issue. Yeah, we, 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 okay, I'm an expert by having a PhD in the field, you have written 10 books. What is the expertise of the client? They're ignoring the fact. I mean, to me, this is a fact, and that's why there's not two sides to it. Because if you have, I mean, it's like, the earth revolves around the sun, right? Of course, they did argue this for a while. They did argue about yeah. this. Yeah. But see, this is what I'm trying to get to, right? You can make an argument for it. You have the one historian sitting here saying, here's what the Nile is all about. And then maybe you show a film clip, right, in which you say, these are, let's say, like, you know, two or three scenes of the Nile conference where they explain what they're actually saying. But the moment you put them on the panel, what are you basically implying exists between the two presenters? Yeah. They both have credible evidence. Exactly. Why do you basically say the person who has the Holocaust has the same level of expertise and standing as the person who has research the Holocaust? And that is sort of like you know, the average draw line. Right? I would make an argument that you can have two sides, too many stories. But in this case, the question basically is right. Did it happen as, in this case, all serious historians agree, or did it not happen this way? And I would say, right, in this case here, there is no other side. Because ultimately speaking, right, what you then do, I think, is again fall into this trap here. And this basically is saying, you know what, look, the evidence <coughs> confirms that millions of people are dying. Of course, now I will tell you that because it's not the same number every single time, right? We can't be sure. And the answer is not this. We can't be sure. We do know that this has happened. And from my perspective, therefore, I would argue no. There are not two sides to this. Not at all. There's only one. And I think that leaves you unpersuaded, doesn't it? If I read your face correctly? Well, saying one side is nonsense, they still have a side, they still have a perspective, even if they're completely wrong. Good, but so it's still the other way. side in the sense. I mean, what I'm trying to suggest here is, my example would be, and I think I have this on you, and you can do it the other way around Imagine that you have, and speak, you are the speakers to all, committee, right? right? Imagine you have a denier who says, I would love to give you a here on campus. So we allow this. Right. I, mean, I think the issue is, it's not a discussion about whether it occurred or not, if you're going to have a panel. It's a discussion, it might be a discussion about different reasons why it happened, but it happened. So if you have someone on there that's denying that it happened, that misses the point of the panel. So I don't think you should be on the panel for that reason. And the second part is, it legitimizes a view that is, it's not even that it's it's, it's, it's not true, it's not accurate, it's none of that, so it legitimizes it, and that's the last thing that needs to be done, is to legitimize something that, I mean, are we going to let someone, that, you know, say the earth is flat, or, or whatever, so that's... that's right. The moment you give them that space, you say, you know what, you have something to say, and that's what five reasons are, I would be skeptical as well. How about the rest of you? Should we let them talk here on campus? You all agree with Judith? Yeah. I mean, we all are her, but I'm sure some of you... Would they be speaking just themselves? They would present their points and go home? Would it be a, a debate? Would there be a You pick. Challenge? I can give you the panel option. I can give you the lecture option. Any way you'd like to. Yeah. Should they be able to speak? You're talking about Holocaust denial? Yeah. yeah. You would say no. Why not? Because they don't have credible... They don't have... They don't have a side. They mm -hmm. can't... There's, I don't even know how to put it into words because it's just so crazy. But you see, see, this is exactly what I'm trying to get back to it. My problem basically is that, look, you can look at the Holocaust from different angles. Yes. Can you talk about, like, you know, what are different ways of studying how many victims there are? Yes. But do you study if there are victims? Question mark? No. That is not a legitimate question, right? Because we do know from a multiplicity of evidence from pictures of Amnesty Conrad, there obviously are millions of victims. So they were saying, right, there is no other side to it. That's exactly, I think, what you point to in the big picture. And that is, there is no other side to the Holocaust. When historians debate this, why are they debating? 
They're talking about what led to the hook. Right. Which, by the way, up to the present day, is still a question of this up to the back. Some historians make the argument that the Nazis implemented the final solution when they feared the United States is going to come into the war. And almost the moment of panic is saying, now we have to kill. Some historians argue the exact opposite. They make the argument when they were, before Stalingrad, and were convinced they had beaten the Russians. That's, that's when they begin to kill us, well, right? So actually, what really eventually triggered the final solution is unclear up to the present day. But do historians argue about if there was a final solution? Right? That is beyond debate. Indeed, what capitalist denies are very, very good at using debates between historians to say, well, obviously, why did they question the entire thing? And that, of course, is not the case. And that's why I personally would argue, uh -uh. there is no other side to this. But there's a difference between having somebody, inviting somebody to campus and say somebody got up in the free speech area and wanted to talk. I mean, they have a right to do that. I would, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't deny them that right, but to invite them, well, I mean, I mean, you know, are you, what are you gonna do? You say you can't talk? This is <laughs> See, from my perspective, this is this is a tricky one. I mean, if you if you ask me personally, I would say sort of your First Amendment rights enables you to hold this opinion and also to publish it. So, for instance, like you know, I do not believe the government should sit down and say the moment you deny the Holocaust, the webpage should take down the webpage. I think that should be legal. However, should we as a college, and I obviously don't call the shots here, but should we as a college, right, give people the space? Do not have a well, that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you may not invite them as far as somebody coming on campus and initiating. But if you yeah. just drop here, huh. I think my response would be probably to pick up my phone and call the cops and say, get this person off here. I see. I trust our students more than that. I trust our students and what I've seen in my classes to see right through this and laugh the man off the campus or woman or. I would hope so. <laughs> See, the thing is, I would hope that when you have a record person like this draw, I think probably like what? 90%, like 100% student will probably realize what's happening here. But how about the 5% that don't? Well, it's a good opportunity for to take that elsewhere and, and have somebody at least refute that in some way. Well, if you know. I, but the thing is, I can stand here and tell you basically what the argument's about, how we made and tell you they're obviously off, right? But if you have some random person coming in here, right, should we give them the right to present those views? Unfortunately, we can't control that, yeah, I don't think. Yes. But I, mean, I still don't think that we should in our case. If we have a say in this, right, if we are in some position to say yes or no, I do not think we should allow this. Right? If you want to publish this on your own account, on your web page, if you want to print a book, go for it. But don't come to my background and do it when I have a say in this, that I should allow this or not. So that person even, I will draw a line. I think, I mean, if some person wanted to present here like this, and I have a vote in the committee, I would know. I would say, don't give this person this space. Mm -hmm. I think there's a difference between I would n I would think we should absolutely not sanction, you know, bring in a speaker like we bring in legitimate speakers because that person wouldn't be legitimate. But as far as the right to say something on the, you know, the free speech area, people can talk about the most ridiculous things there unless they're you know inciting people to to riot or threatening or do anything like that. Okay. They do have that right. So. I mean, what, what it, the point to do is, what, I mean, think about the motivation behind it. I mean, if you just say, I do not believe the Holocaust happened, think about what's the motivation behind this. I mean, who are those people? What do you know about them? And I think you can easily guess what we're talking about here. Well, no matter their motivation, as long as, again, they're not doing something illegal, it, it, I, I don't think that we can protect everybody. I mean, I think everybody is, it's also everybody's responsibility to come to their own terms with that. I mean, we, we can't control what people see on the web, you know, oh, all of those kinds of things. That's what I'm saying. You have to write as well as I can publish anything that you want to, pretty much, with few exceptions. That I agree with you. But what I'm saying is if you have a person from the campus like this, right, they have motivation. They have picked this campus for a reason. Right? They're not just trying to say here the Holocaust didn't happen. But where do you, but do you, you want draw this? the line when you're talking about that kind of... Yeah, I would draw a line at the current time where there basically is no debate, no dispute, because here's the someone who basically preaches hatred for a specific purpose. Yeah, even if they're just talking out in class or, or talking in free speech area, they're still doing something illegal. Even if they're just talking out in class or are talking in free speech area, you would shut that conversation. If it is a conversation that basically tries to induce other people to hate other people. And again, that's why I'm asking you think about why they're doing it. Why does something not do the cost? Why? What do we want to basically happen as a result of people learning that nonsense? What do you think they want to accomplish? Oh, that the 
the Nazis were underdogs and poor them, and, and they were really good people, and so they should have support. Let's Nazis do this again. Are you serious? Nazis maybe was not that bad idea. And think about this. I mean, you probably, I mean, if you take my European history class, you know this. But in 1950, you look at in Germany, and they asked, do you believe Nazism was a good idea, poorly implemented? Do you know what Germans said? 55% said yes. <coughs> if a Nazi successor party would have been able to run in West Germany in the 1950s, they would have won the election and probably would have gotten a clear outer majority. If you ask people today why is Nazism wrong, most folks have no idea what Nazism means, but they have heard about the Holocaust. Take away that knowledge, more people have to say. Maybe there are two sides to the story. Maybe we should look into this. The idea to say right now, we have a crisis here, right? The economy is doing really poorly. Let's stop all the bickering Congress, right? They argue and argue nothing get done. Let's get one strong, powerful person in there who fixes everything. Black Hitler. Yeah, right. South, maybe not so bad right now to a lot of folks. And that's the thing, right? Take the Holocaust out of Lord Sabi. Fascism to some folks, you know what? It might not sound so bad. By the way, we had a Holocaust denier come within a hair's breadth of winning the governorship of Louisiana. Yes. Uh, that was state to do. You remember that, 89, 91, somewhere there. You know, one of the states, frankly, that has one of the most backward public educational systems in the United States. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And that's the fear. Mm -hmm. right. And so what I'm trying to say is, when you think about this denial here, right, they're not just denying it for the sake of denial, but they have a concrete political agenda. Mm -hmm. And if you basically think about this, if you're trying to solve fascism today, take the Holocaust out of the equation, and then you know what? Can you solve this much easier? Absolutely yes. And again, keep in mind, it's not just Nazis and fascists are doing it. Think about the people who say, you know what? We are doing history the wrong way. We always talk about the victims. What happens if you take the Holocaust out of history? It didn't happen. Duke would him and Holland say, well, you know, atrocities were committed by both sides. And he probably would have been one of those, well, maybe a couple hundred thousand people, something like that. But both sides did those bad things during the war. I mean, while the things that Holocaust denies, obviously, was to connect what happened to the war between the Allies and the Nazis. Mm -hmm. So they would say, there are people being killed in camp, mm -hmm. but hey, then you fire bomb Dresden. Mm -hmm. Right? Really, what is worse? Mm -hmm. And so this sort of like the moral equivalency is what they're always doing. Mm -hmm. And there are some people basically <coughs> have argued that the firebombing section was a cultural Holocaust. Was trying to destroy the, the libraries, the buildings, right? To actually destroy German cultural memory as well. It's very complicated, <coughs> but of course it's on the same line. Yeah. But okay, so, Professor, if, if this is the case, why haven't, if they actually did, uh, the Nazis go to Argentina and Venezuela, haven't they tried to, to build their parties there, or have they just called them something else? I think the answer is no. There is no Nazi successor party that really is close to the ideas of the Nazis, they as we have today. They don't have anyone to rally behind. Correct. But I mean, the ideas, I think, today try to get people out under the exact same slogan as the Nazis used. That wouldn't happen. But, correct. Right. You know what? Good idea, bad implemented, right? Mm -hmm. That, I think, is still out there, that still could be attracted to a whole lot of people. And I think that's dangerous. And keep in mind, right, to give you one example. Think about the people saying, we shouldn't always talk about slavery. We shouldn't always talk about what happened to Native Americans, right? Let's talk about the progress that we have made in the West. Right? That narrative. Take the Holocaust out, take other massacres out and all of a sudden, what do you have? <coughs> you have the best of the best, and it's right back. Right? And so in this case, people believe that, you know what? We have in many ways presented our history in the wrong way. We are the highest achievement of culture, of what humanity has produced. And that is also a reason why, but not just fascists, but many of them to say as well, right? These things, we just have to downplay them a little bit. And if you read history, you see this over and over and over again. And so I think that is a temptation, not just among fascists, but among also people who want to take pride again, who be in German history, but also could be in the West, who would be very, very glad to see this go. And so I think when you look at those guys here, right, I think that's their agenda. And I think that is something that should be stopped. Absolutely. So what happens to Holocaust deniers in Germany? Very simple. If you say it in public, with witnesses, they will at first probably take you to tell you to stop, they can arrest you for this, and they will take you to court. And then either you can get fined, if it's the first time, you might get a jail sentence, if you do it repeatedly. And then of course in the case of David Irving, that you know, the guy who shoots up many of these books, this will be with that in the country anymore. 
I have no exact number of countries by now that think I can run a travel trip. But of course, in all those countries, think Australia, New Zealand, think Canada has similar laws as well, but you have outlawed to lie or to lie about the protocol, or to crash them. That means automatically you won't even have to the country anymore. So that's something that you can easily do. The Germanies come down very hard. They, there is the law. The Germany, the Holocaust is simply an undisputed fact. No question asked. And if you do, you break the law. Okay, since you have something up here, this might be the time that I can look at the clock. Because we have about seven minutes to do that. So let's see. Anything on this that we haven't talked about this, you are interested in? Or anything else that you should address? Um, I don't think the content is different. I think the way you approach the students is different. I mean, keep in mind, yes. if you go to the German school system, you will hear about the Holocaust at least three times. It shows up basically like you know already like you know, in the first four years, primary school. If you get if you go to a seven or eight year school, like you know, two more times. If you later on take the second year, like in you know, school path, you would hear about it four or five times. Because it's, it's, it's the country's history, it's, Correct. it's the people's history also. So it's everywhere, it's on TV, it's in bookstores, indeed in the state where I grew up from. The law says you have to visit the campus. They will not let you graduate from school. And you haven't been. So the idea is, it's everywhere. You can't miss it. The question, of course, is now what do you think is the response of the students? And see, this is why you have to tackle them very, very different. If I talk to American crowd and I begin to introduce my lecture on the Holocaust, my sense is, I don't do much to motivate them, right? They will listen to me from the get-go. That's a topic that almost everybody's interested in. In Germany, it's going to do different ways. They are interested or they're saying, look, this has been 80 years ago, what do I have to do with this? They're still talking about this, right? This makes us all look bad, just forget about this. And then too, you get this wrong. It's like a dirty pass. Perfect, right? Yeah, I mean, you've probably seen some Americans as well. I mean, you talk about stadiums, like, oh, come on, let's not talk about this. You know, that kind of thing. And that's it. And then you have the small, hot cuckoo who basically still believes, you know what, there is something to Nazis. And that's very important about this. But that group right now is very small. But I would say, as far as the state is concerned, I think you can make a good case that they're trying very, very hard to get information out. Of course, you remember when you sit in the classroom? You can listen, or you can close your ears. If you ever, I mean, if you, if you ever visit the camp and you come on the same day as the at class, right, if the bus is parked outside and the kids go through here, you will see some kids who are, who are shocked, who are depressed with still getting it, but the also are kids walking around, smiling, having a good time, right? It's a day of school, and they're obviously not getting it. So my response to this is always like, you know, I think the policy is there, but you can't argue it on the video, right? Why not get it on Anybody? Which camp did you visit? Dachau. I mean, see, like, you know, we never got an hour from here. Anybody? Say something about how it seems like on one extreme in the Middle East and elsewhere that Holocaust denial is tied, frankly, to a hatred of Israel. Mm -hmm. The notion it never happened. It was a Jewish hoax to create the sympathy for the creation after the war of the Jewish state. How important a thread do you think that is? And maybe, given this, well, given events in the Middle East, is there is it problematic that that kind of perspective could grow? I mean, the first thing you have to say is, I mean, there is no historian the same level as we have in the West, right? Who actually has come up with a investigative account to the Holocaust. When we talk about Holocaust now in the Middle East, it usually means taking over the arguments, right? That have been produced here in the West. And that must certainly exist, and my understanding is also many schools by now. That that, like, you know, is teaching about the Middle East as well. On the other hand, if I talk to the people that I know here from the Middle East, they almost all tell me that, look, most people who live there, if they have a certain application, they know the Holocaust happened, they have seen the pictures, they are convinced that it happened, they don't know it, but they have one fear. And this is that somehow, why is the West so the part of Israel? And they basically believe that ultimately it is the Holocaust. That is the root cause why the of the United States and Germany are so supportive of Israel. And so I think oftentimes it's actually instrumental. It's not the denial of Holocaust per se, but they believe that if the Holocaust, right, would be less important, maybe because few people were being killed. That would weaken the support of the West for Israel, and that might, for instance, force Israel then, right, to be more willing to accept a compromise between Israel and Palestine. So it's more instrumental there, I think. Mm -hmm. What parallels do you see between the Holocaust and 
some of these other cleansings that are going on in the Middle East among the different groups? Well, see, the thing is, parallel is a tricky question. I mean, the thing is, I am one of those historians who believes that like, the Holocaust is singular. I mean, okay. you know, if you think about all the other like, you know, genocides in the 20th century, I think the Holocaust is singular. For a very simple reason. Take the example, let's say, of, let's say, if you graphic, right? what happened in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. The point there was to kill the minority group within one country. That's what the Nazis did. The Nazis wanted to kill every single Jew in Germany, in Poland, in Russia. They even were trying to get the Jews from Japan deported. And I think there's about 200 there. Mm -hmm. And so they did it basically I tried to get every single last person on the planet. Mm -hmm. Not just in your own country, thing, but the Armenians also. But I think that's totally different. And so I also think that you cannot compare the Holocaust to everything because the endeavor is so much larger in terms of scope than anything else. But the idea of ethnic cleansing, moving people around, right? That yeah, was certainly something that has happened in other genocides. But again, in the Nazi case, right, the idea of rounding people up, taking them to train stations, to camps, at least in the Middle East, I haven't seen this yet. So I would say, like, you know, on that level, Still, yes. why they are, kill them all and go on. I don't think there's any genocide in history that can completely parallel the Holocaust because it is by far the largest in scale. But I think there are smaller versions mm -hmm. of it, such as you said, Armenia. Right. See, there are many parallels. I mean, think about Armenia and the Holocaust, right? A state turning the group of its population under the cover of war, mm -hmm. marching out of town, mass shootings, camps, right? Mm -hmm. You have both of those most dirty in Armenia as of the Holocaust. Yeah, you know about this. Yeah, it's like the Turkish parallel, the Nazis and the Good. Armenians. But do the Turks let's now invade Russia by right, trying to get to the Armenian minority here? The answer is no, right? So the idea is it's basically focused on the idea of creating a Turkish state. And I think, see, that's where the comparison then, like, you know, comes to that. I would say Nazi, there was simply much more. <coughs> think about this. When Turkey is created, they have no, or they make no attempt whatsoever like, to go beyond the point. If the Nazis could have won, would they have stopped? No. They would have literally tried to kill every single Jew on the planet. So what I'm saying is they are almost certainly perilous, right? But I would always say the Holocaust still, despite all similarities, it is singular. There's simply no event in history that we know of that will come anywhere near the magnitude of what was being attempted. In. But you can argue with me about that one. I do know many historians actually make the argument that the Holocaust is more than time. I don't share that view, but that, that's a whole different story. Anybody else? Do you think they have laws in all the countries like they do in Germany again? Should they? Are you asking me if they should? I think it would say it depends. I mean, I think for Germany, this is a very, very good law. Do you think like, it would keep the other countries safe? Yeah, see, the thing is, if you understand the German history behind this, I think to say, you know what, you cannot question the Holocaust, I think that is a good law based on history. In the United States, right, does the United States in any way suffer, like, you know, a huge damage to the overall society by not having this law? I would say no, because I think there are other means to combat Holocaust analysis here as well. But I think in German circumstance, that's a good idea. I would support that. Mm -hmm. I was wondering what you thought about kind of the future of, if not Nazism, fascism, ultranationalist groups, because I know in EU elections mm -hmm. just recently there was kind of a surge on the far right. Mm -hmm. Do you see any kind of future for this kind of ideology? My fear is I think Nazism per se, like you know, is discredited for a number of reasons. The genocide also remains you know, Nazis in the end turn on their own people. I remember Hitler fights until the very end. He basically said, you know what, look, we all see proof, we are not the mass race, and he wanted his own people to be destroyed. And I think that is also a little bit discredited in Nazism. But fascists per se, anti-fascism, I think that is there, but what <coughs> people still is a viable option. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something you also have to keep your eye open, because that might come back faster than you think. I know it's a big question among historians about debating the aspects of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. This notion that it went beyond fanatical Nazis, that the German people were Hitler's willing executioners, to use the title of the book. Where do you come down on that? On well, that see, question? I would say, I wouldn't say executioners, but I think the idea of saying, here's the Nazis and here's the Germans. I think you can do this. But the famous case, of course, is that of the special troops. You probably remember when the troops go through in the East, right behind the regular troops, you always have these special units. And they basically would round up the people from the camps and then actually, in mass shootings by hand, kill over a million people. And the question is, why are those guys Nazis? And the answer is, you know, those are usually regular noble men, too old to serve in their 40s, but from a broad section of the population. And when they were told to pull the trigger, they pulled the trigger. And there's a very famous study on this. And they basically were trying to find out where those guys coerced 
right? But it would, you shoot or we kill you. And the answers, they were not. Indeed, oftentimes the commanders told them, if you don't want to do this, step out, step aside. And so I would argue basically, look, who sets the wheel in motion? It's the Nazis. What about this? Did the Nazis have a hard time finding Germans who are willing to kill Jews? The answer is no. I think that basically the responsibility for the Holocaust goes well beyond people who are members of the Nazi party to a broad section of German population as well. students have the, the knowledge to be able to see something like this and to like say, okay, that's not true, that's also not counting the percentage of, even though it almost seems crazy that there would be people like this, but who aren't informed. So if they can, the, the possibility of, you know, that small percentage of people who are, are not informed on Holocaust, or maybe heard about it a little bit, like they remember it from middle school or high school or whatever, but and have not really fully addressed and studied it they could be pulled into something like this. So that, that's, I think, another reason this lecture is so interesting is because it, it's not only here for you know, our classes or for the book and stuff, but to inform people that these, these people, deniers, will try to pull you in and stuff like that. I don't want to understand you by on a sad note. So let me rephrase this and say, like, look, the data I will give you now is there to basically tell us all you know what, we have to be very diligent. Let me see. In 1993, Americans were asked, do you think it's possible or impossible that the Holocaust did not happen? So this is a double negative here, right? Mm -hmm. I mean about the most awkward way you can phrase it. Mm -hmm. Basically, do you think it's possible or not that the Holocaust happened? How many people do you think said they think it is impossible? I saw in the book it said about a fifth. Twenty-two percent. And you can of course imagine like in the dead we created a firestorm in the population. And of course a lot of people said like, look, it's the way of questioning, right? So to rephrase the question make it clear. Do you believe the Holocaust happened, probably happened, but did not happen? It happened. You know what the answer was for those who said, probably happened, but not happened? 17%. So, I don't want to depress you, but the answer is, this is an issue. We should indeed be very vigilant about. Did you say 17 or 17? 17. Okay, as in 16 plus 1. Okay. Okay. Not an accident. Okay. Not especially okay. sure. But in 16 plus 1 is scary. <laughs> that is really, really scary. Because that tells you know what? That ground on which the team can fall. That is unfortunate. <laughs> so, if you have no more questions, let me thank you for coming by. We didn't get to the part of how exactly to connect to the book, but I do have four copies here. So, if you do not have your copy yet, if you look me in the eye, I will give you one. I will give you one. You want one? Are you still in need? Here you go. Anybody else?